My name is Saba Douglas Hamilton. I'm a wildlife filmmaker, a trustee of the charity Save the Elephants in Kenya, and I'm also the chair of the International Selection Committee for the Future for Nature Award. I found it rather difficult to drag myself into the 21st century, and I still have a lot of problem dealing with things like social media. Um, my husband has been trying to teach me the importance of Facebook and Twitter and all of these things, ensuring me that it matters enormously, but I just find it takes so much effort to do these things. Uh, it takes up so much of your time, and uh, I tend to find that I like to focus my time in other places and see if he can do it for me. I have several personal heroes. I think, fundamentally, the most important ones for me have been my family, my mother, my father, my grandmother, and my um, grandfather who was killed during the war. They've all been very inspirational, uh, real ro role models, and people whose principles I believe in. But there are also other people, historically, who I find fascinating. Uh, the explorer, Richard Burton, um, Winston Churchill, of course. I think Jane Goodall is a tremendous influence and um, very important person. She's, she's raised huge amounts of awareness about why it's important to try to protect the natural world. And people in that kind of league have been uh, something that have certainly influenced my thinking. At the moment, we're facing a terrible elephant poaching crisis in Africa, Africa-wide. In fact, I often feel that the word poaching doesn't really do justice to what's happened. It's, it's illegal killing. It's rapacious, opportunistic, illegal killing. And much of it is, is driven by criminal gangs who've now got involved for profit. The other sinister side to it is that we're finding that ivory trade or the illegal ivory trade is linked to militias like the Lord's Resistance Army, um, the Janjaweed and Al-Shabaab who are using ivory as a, as a way to fund terrorist activities. So it's a very frightening shift in what's happening to the elephants. And in the last two years alone in Africa, it's been estimated that we've lost about 50,000 elephants. And that's a minimum number. I, I think the problem is that there's quite a lot of confusion as to the status of the ivory trade, the international ivory trade. The fact is the international ivory trade has been banned since 1989 worldwide. I think what's caused a lot of the confusion is that there's been a relaxing of the ban in that CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, allowed for two experimental one-off sales of ivory stockpiles firstly to Japan and then to Japan and China. And it looks like when the second sale took place, it allowed for illegal ivory to slip in under the radar and basically it reopened the floodgates of an illegal ivory market. So while international trade is banned, domestic trade in certain countries is not banned. The problem is that with criminal syndicates getting involved, it's very difficult to tell now which is legal ivory and which is illegal ivory. So I think the key thing that we have to do now is start pushing for domestic markets to be banned, domestic internal trade to be banned. And the most important thing of all, as well, beyond law enforcement in the countries of origin, is to now try to reach out to the people who are buying ivory, who are often completely unaware that ivory comes from dead elephants. There was a, a survey that was done in China amongst Chinese buyers where many of them thought that ivory just fell off naturally every year in the same way that antlers fall off deer. And that they, weren't, they didn't realize, they didn't make the connection between ivory and dead elephants. And I think as soon as we can, if we can share that awareness with that market, very quickly it can turn around uh, the demand and lower it because people, you know, people shy away from that. And certainly our experience from before in 1989 was that the Japanese market basically tailed off and pretty much died because 
um, Japanese people didn't want to buy ivory from dead elephants. I think right now, the Future for Nature Foundation and the award itself is like, it's like the fertilizer that you put on a small sapling when you plant a, a little tree. It, it, it gives that critical boost that the sapling needs to start to grow, to spread its branches, to become a large, powerful, established organism. And I've been very interested recently to have begun to come across Future for Nature uh, winners, previous winners in, in different places. So for example, just at the beginning of this week, I met Ophir Drory, who was a Future for Nature winner, I think in 2011. And he operates in Cameroon, in uh, West Africa. Uh, he's been, he started an organization called the Last Great Ape Organization. And he's been involved very much in um, prosecuting wildlife crime in Cameroon and has now spread his work to six other Central African countries. But there he was in Nairobi at an ivory and insecurity meeting that I was at. And it was just wonderful to suddenly have that link to see that there was this person from the other side of the continent and we, you know, we were able to come together, we were able to talk about the problems that we were experiencing, to share knowledge and build on that contact and hopefully move forward. So what I see for Future for Nature in the future is this, the importance of this network that is being created. And the more that they can, they can pull all of their winners and their nominees together and create a hub that can support these young people and that then can hold the network and, and make it something actually becomes much more powerful because people can share knowledge and ideas and help each other. And I think Future of Nature will grow and grow and grow and become something that really is, is, is like a, a springboard to help young conservations leap up into their careers. Because in my lifetime alone, so much of what I knew as a child of wild places and wild animals has disappeared. But today I've been very inspired by Jane Goodall and what she said. And as an anthropologist or somebody who's studied chimpanzees and, and looked at the similarities of chimpanzees and human beings, she has an incredible belief in the ability of the human spirit, the indomitable human spirit as she calls it, she has great belief in our resilience and in the resilience of the natural world. And she has great belief in young people. And I think the key message really is hope. So today I'm feeling more hopeful. I, I do believe very much that if a young generation is getting involved in conservation, that they can become the new conservation leaders and essentially decide the fate of what's going to happen to the planet. I do feel people are becoming more conscious. I think the word is spreading and we've just got to keep going at it. Yes. I, really at the moment, I think we're, we're suffering such a huge elephant poaching crisis in Kenya that it's been very much a situation of all hands on deck. Uh, my husband has joined our organization Save the Elephant and has now become the chief operations officer. I've been doing a lot of things also with them but I finally got to a stage in my personal life where my children are a little bit older and I'm beginning to put my toes back into the water of filmmaking. So I hope that this year I can start getting things going again and start making wildlife films again because that really is, I suppose, my great love, my passion, my, my career. And I really want to keep on spreading the message. I think that there's so much that we can learn about the natural world. There's so much we can learn from the natural world. And there is this urgency to getting the message out.